It was the end days of the Vietnam War. America had largely withdrawn, and the North Vietnamese were closing in on what was known at the time as Saigon, the largest city in South Vietnam. It was about to fall to communist rule. The United States, with support from allied nations, sought to execute an evacuation operation of Saigon. This included the topic of discussion today, Operation Babylift. Operation Babylift is known primarily for two reasons. The evacuation of thousands of children, including babies from South Vietnam, and the devastating plane crash that claimed 138 of those lives. And that's what we'll be focusing on today. April 4th, 1975. The final fall of Saigon in the end of the Vietnam War was less than one month away. This video is not necessarily about the Vietnam War, but we do need some context. Whatever favor the American public had for the war by the early 1970s had begun to dry up. The war had become exceedingly unpopular, and American troops were largely withdrawn from fighting in the wake of the signing of a ceasefire with North Vietnam, following effectively an American defeat, with only a comparatively smaller number of Americans positioned in Saigon. South Vietnam was in a state of chaos, as the American withdrawal left South Vietnam on their own to fight against the North, which continued until 1975. The North pushed further south until it was time for them to take Saigon. Countless numbers of people sought to exit from the state in demise. During the 19-year-long conflict, hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese children were orphaned. Every child had a story. For some, their parents were killed in the war. Some were just left, abandoned. Some had an American parent, and others were, for lack of a better term, unwanted by Vietnamese families. Operation Babylift, in theory, was supposed to give those orphans a chance to be adopted by families abroad, in countries such as the United States, Australia, the Philippines, West Germany, among others. The children were brought to the Tansanet Air Base, this site would eventually become Tansanat International Airport. There, a Lockheed C-5 Galaxy transport plane, operated by the United States Air Force, was to pick them up and fly them to Clark Air Base in the Philippines. From there, the children would continue on with their journeys to their new families and their new lives. The Lockheed C-5 Galaxy is a massive plane. In fact, it's one of the largest in the entire world. It's equipped with four engines, comes fitted with an enormous fuselage with compartments for cargo or military transport on the lower deck, and a passenger cabin on the upper deck, which is where you'll also find the cockpit. To load the Galaxy with cargo, two doors can open at the front and rear to allow ease of access for vehicles. In the context of Operation Babylift, these planes were flown in carrying military supplies and equipment, and instead of being flown out again empty, they were to be used to fly these children out of the country. In fact, the accident plane flew weapons into Saigon that morning before the disaster occurred. The older children were boarded into the lower cargo deck. This is an actual photograph that was taken that day before the plane took off by a Vietnamese photographer. As you can see, many passengers were strapped to the actual flooring of the cargo deck. The upper deck was usually reserved for the babies. The accident occurred on the very first Operation Babylift flight on April 4th, 1975. The United States President Gerald Ford announced the commencing of the operation the previous day. 314 people were on board the massive plane. The passengers didn't just consist of children, but there were also many from the local orphanages staff from the U.S. Embassy, and journalists and media crews. At the flight controls that day was Captain Dennis Trainer. He was a rather young captain. His friends simply called him Bud. Sat next to him in the right seat was another captain by the name of Tilford Harp. Sat in the flight engineer's position was Master Sergeant Alan Engels. With the large plane fully loaded with 314 people on board, 285 passengers, and a total of 29 members of crew, the doors were requested to be shut. Upon trying to close the massive aft door and ramp, 
Problems were noted with the locking of the door. The door was reopened and closed again multiple times until it was adequately locked. Now would be a good time to discuss the locking mechanism of this door ramp on the C5, as this was where a critical failure occurred. Each side of this door on the C5 is fitted with seven locks, 14 in total. It is important to know before we proceed with the events of the accident that at least three of these locks had failed to either close properly or would come undone in flight. The door was not properly secured and was not as strong as it should have been on the accident plane. We'll come back to why that might have happened later. Even despite knowing the locks were not properly secured, evident by the opening and shutting of the door before takeoff, it was believed and even looked like the door had locked securely, when it wasn't. The overall climate of the situation meant that a number of rules were sort of bent as the pressure was mounting to get going. With the doors shut, the plane taxied out to the runway for takeoff, where it departed at 4.03 in the afternoon. Pretty quickly, the plane was making a line out over the South China Sea. The plane continued to climb and ascend higher. As the plane begins to pressurize, the aircraft's skin becomes a barrier between the high density air on the inside and the lower density air on the outside. The air inside the plane begins to push on the skin, including the large door at the back of the aircraft. As the plane continues to climb, this force becomes stronger with every foot of altitude gained. Passing through 20,000 feet, everything appeared to be normal. However, it was when the plane was about 10 miles out over the sea and was passing through 23,000 feet that the pressure difference on the improperly secured door became just too much to handle and the critical failure occurred. In a single moment, the door itself was blown outward and a lot happened in that moment. When the door was blown off, it severed some of the plane's mechanical wiring and critical hydraulic fluid lines. The Galaxy has a total of four separate hydraulic lines. Two of them were now damaged in the explosive decompression, and that hydraulic fluid was draining away. This hydraulic fluid was used to manipulate the enormous flight control surfaces that control the plane, ailerons, elevators, rudder, and so forth which is why some people sometimes refer to the hydraulic fluid as the blood of the plane. In this case, the hydraulics involving the rudder, elevator, and one of the ailerons, along with the wiring which controls the elevator and rudder trim, were severed, rendering them useless and inoperative. Before we continue with how this affected the pilot's handling of the aircraft, we should highlight what else happened when the door was blown off. This was an explosive decompression. The pressurized air inside the plane escaped outside. A fog-like mist enveloped the interior of the plane almost immediately following the decompression. Though the lower deck was filled with passengers, they were secured to their seating, or flooring, and it's believed the only things that were blown out of the plane was the door and any unsecured objects and debris. Naturally, in a scenario like this, the oxygen supplies needed to be used. Because the air inside the plane was now no different from the outside, the air at 23,000 feet is much thinner, less dense, and doesn't contain enough oxygen for humans to breathe and receive the necessary oxygen requirements our bodies demand. Also, try to understand something about the oxygen supply on this plane. This was a military transport plane. It came with oxygen equipment made primarily for adults. Try to imagine for a second what that must have been like in the upper passenger cabin for those looking after the dozens of babies to not only make sure that they received their own oxygen, but also needing to attend to the oxygen needs of the babies using masks that weren't designed for them. Going back to the cockpit, very quickly Captain Trainer noticed a massive problem with the flight controls. He established that he had control of one aileron, maintaining some control over the roll axis, but he had lost the elevator control, the pitch axis. The plane started to lean forward and pick up a lot of speed as the aircraft entered a nosedive. Despite the lack of pitch control, the nose eventually started to rise, as excessive speed was converted into greater lift, 
The nose naturally raised uncontrollably, and the plane began a steep climb, following an oscillating pattern of rising and falling. Captain Trainer effectively needed to relearn how to control his plane. What he found out was that by manipulating the throttle controls, he could somewhat control the pitch. Increasing the throttle would provide greater speed and, in time, lift the nose. Decreasing the throttle would do the opposite. This in combination with the limited control of the roll axis, the flight crew could turn the plane back around to the Tansonut base. The pilots really didn't have much else they could rely on. They guided their stricken plane back towards Saigon. They also didn't have a whole lot of time. They needed to descend to around 10,000 feet. At that altitude, the outside air is more breathable. Just before lining up with the runway, the plane began to plunge again, reaching a downward vertical speed in excess of 4,000 feet per minute. The plunge in altitude made it clear that they wouldn't make it to the runway. They attempted to approach from the northeast. Back in 1975, Ho Chi Minh City, as it's known today, then Saigon, was a lot smaller than it is today. Under the flight path to the runway back then was Vietnamese countryside. Falling short of the runway, the large plane impacted a rice field, where it traversed along the ground for around 300 meters before it lifted into the air again. From there, it gained some altitude, flew over the Saigon River, and impacted into the ground for a second time. This was when the plane crashed, as you could say. This second impact tore the aircraft apart, the fuselage breaking into multiple sections. The wings had separated from the rest of the plane, and they erupted into flames. The lower cargo compartment, filled with passengers, a lot of them children, was one of the most damaged sections of the plane, and was where most of the fatalities occurred. The upper deck fared a lot better. The flight crew had survived, as did many of the babies in the passenger cabin. However, many more weren't so lucky. Most fatalities, as mentioned, were from those sat in the lower deck. Sadly, 78 children on board the plane perished in the disaster, as did numerous others, from US government officials to American servicemen, totaling 138 dead but there were 176 survivors. As the country of South Vietnam was in its end days, the investigation into this tragedy was certainly very different from other investigations. For one thing, shortly after the plane crashed, looting became rampant at the scene, and critical aircraft parts went missing. Because the fall of Saigon was imminent, investigators needed to gather what they could and leave Vietnam. There was, however, an effort to locate the missing door from the aircraft. U.S. Navy vessels searched a region of the South China Sea until it was eventually discovered. Investigators, sure enough, discovered multiple failed locks on the door. They had failed to do their job and never closed correctly. So what was the deal with these locks? Well, a certain practice of cannibalization of aircraft parts meant that many components were often swapped out with other planes. Such was the case with the Axton aircraft. A certain component for adjusting the locks was removed from the Axton plane, and new ones were eventually fitted. But the maintenance job to do this was inadequate, and the new locks were fitted in a way that they either would not connect or would come undone in flight. It's also believed that maintenance workers did not check them before releasing the plane. Investigators found that poor maintenance was at fault. It was concluded that the failure of the door crippled the aircraft's flight controls. This accident, in a lot of ways, can be compared to a number of others from around this time, when larger jet planes were first hitting the scene. There were complications with doors. Just over one year before the Saigon accident, an explosive decompression of the cargo door of a DC-10 passenger plane severed the aircraft's flight controls, ultimately killing 346 people. Investigators there exposed a design flaw in how these doors were locked. The Boeing 747 also had an incident like this. As for the Lockheed C-5 Galaxy, in the wake of the investigation, 
new safety pins were manufactured that could be inserted into the locks when they were properly secured. It became a quick and effective way to know whether or not the locks had actually, you know, locked. In the aftermath, the flight crew of the plane that day received awards and decorations for their efforts. Promotions were also given to other crew members. Operation Babylift continued, despite the accident, and over 3,000 orphans were flown out of South Vietnam, including the survivors of that tragic flight. Less than one month later, on April 30th, Saigon fell, and the Vietnam War was over. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. If you found it to be interesting, be sure to be subscribed, as there is always a new video every Saturday. I am currently in the middle of moving right now. By the time you see this video, I should have actually just picked up the keys to my new place. So there is a lot going on in the background. If the upload schedule changes at all, I'll let you know on the community tab. With a new place is also going to bring a new production place to make these videos, and I'll be investing in some new equipment. I'm hoping a new PC and new audio setup will be coming very soon. Anyway, I would love to give a big mention to my amazing patrons over on Patreon, who have been continuously supporting the channel for nearly two years. I just can't thank them enough for their support. Their names are scrolling on the screen right now. Shout out this week to Diseased Robot for pledging last week. Thank you so very much. If you yourself want to support the channel further and even get your name featured on this list, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from just £1 per month, and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. All patrons get early access to all new content 48 hours before it goes out publicly on YouTube. You'll also find my personal Twitter page in the pinned comment if you would like to follow me on there or however long it has left anyway. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day, and I will see you next week. Goodbye.